Welcome back to Comic Book Historians. I'm Alex Grand. Go ahead and click on that juicy red subscribe button down below. And don't forget to pick up my book, Understanding Superhero Comic Books. Now today I'm talking about Alan Moore and his frustration with the comic book industry. All through the lens of reading his new novella, What We Can Know About Thunderman, that's located in the book Illuminations. Now, Alan Moore encountered a disappointing experience with the comic book industry, as did Jerry Siegel, Joe Schuster, Jack Kirby, and many others. He basically said in a Comics Journal interview that he and Dave Gibbons would inherit the rights of Watchmen back from DC as long as it wasn't kept in print. Unfortunately, some of the higher powers at DC Comics kept Watchmen in print, keeping the rights away from them, creating a resentment with Alan Moore. But there's also the industry reaction creatively that Watchmen fostered, which grew increasingly annoying over time. He maintains that it heralded an era of superhero deconstruction comic books that reduced the value of their overall message. So he compares continuing comic book creators and fans as hopeless drug addicts supporting the larger corporations. But it's important to note that I did not revel in its message. I just found it an interesting way to get to know Alan Moore, one of the greatest comic book writers that's ever existed. The story functions as Moore's impression of the dysfunctional history of superhero comics and provides his perception of how to understand it using fictionalized names that substitute for the real or mostly real analog. I enjoyed it mainly to find out more about how he feels about events that I already know about historically and also to see his rendition of how some of the larger leaders in Marvel and DC became powerful through secret dealings with entities that were higher powers. However, many have understandably called it mean-hearted, and that's probably true, mainly because he has no love for the corporate-run comic book industry. That being said, it became fun to identify who the real-life counterparts to Moore's creators, fictional superheroes, and companies are in his Thunderman story. And I put that list up on an article on comicbookhistorians.com. So make sure to check it out. You might find it a helpful aid in reading the novella. If anyone thinks I got any of it wrong, feel free to let me know. I'd love to look at that. But it does help to decode exactly who he's talking about and why he has such a criticism of the industry. That made him famous. The journey of Moore's disappointment with mainstream superhero comic books can be traced in a series of interviews from 1985 to 1997. Toward the end of his Swamp Thing run, Alan Moore was interviewed in 1987 about what he was trying to achieve with his literary approach to comics, and he displayed an excitement of depicting superheroes in a realistic manner. We can't believe in these super Boy Scouts anymore. We don't know anybody in real life who behaves like that, and the readers don't believe in them, so we've just tried to make them a little bit more like real 20th century human beings. He specifically points to the intrigue of how superheroes would behave if they were real people, as imperfect creatures who would not be noble paragons of virtue. In 1985, he was interviewed by another outlet in which he described his excitement of working on a comic book series called Watchmen for Dick Giordano over at DC Comics. Well, there's a book that I've just been talking to Dick Giordano about, and it's called Watchmen. And what we want to do is to actually examine the implications of the superhero, if these absurd characters were real, just what they'd do to the world, uh, in that if there had been a Superman ever, the world would be unrecognisable. Because, um, well, if you've got a character of Superman's level and power uh, working for the Americans, then um, what would American foreign policy be like? I should imagine it would perhaps be a little bit more adventurous than it is at present, and I should imagine that Russian foreign policy would be a little less adventurous than it is at present, and you'd have a very different world situation. So we, we want to play around with that angle of it. We want to try and examine some of the things that really would happen if there were superheroes, just about all these strange, obsessed super characters. Uh, in a very, very bleak, grim world. And we examine the political aspect and we examine the social aspect. And uh, yeah, we've, we've got a few interesting things coming up and I'm really looking forward to getting into that. As he developed the story with Dave Gibbons, he began to realize that he could push the boundaries of the comics medium as a serious storytelling device that can relay complex ideas and emotions, which he explains in 1989. We deliberately set out to do a piece that was as complex as sophisticated and as multi-layered as the best contemporary mainstream fiction. That's not saying that it's necessarily any good, 
but it sure as hell is complicated. You start off doing a book like Watchmen, for example, aiming it at a 15-year-old comic fan. Halfway through the run, you suddenly find that it's getting literary reviews in prestigious literary magazines, and you find yourself in the main highways and byways of mainstream fiction, dressed with your underwear over your trousers and wearing a red cape. It can be quite a disorienting experience, it's, as well as quite an embarrassing one. However, in 1991, he explains what he intended for the superhero genre with Watchmen versus what he ended up getting. I hoped that Watchmen might show up a lot of the essential silliness and redundancy of the superhero genre. It wasn't meant as a revitalization of the superhero. It was meant as a tombstone for the superhero, at least in my terms. I couldn't see any point in doing superheroes, from my point of view, after Watchmen. Unfortunately, everybody else could. And there have been an awful lot of bad Watchmen clones. Or not just specifically Watchmen clones, but this would ex extend to Dark Knight as well. People who were looking at those faintly grim and postmodern superhero comics of the mid 80s. And instead of moving on from there, have just recycled them again and again and again for the last six years. It's almost like, you know, postmodernism by numbers. You make a few references to William Burroughs, you make a few references to some currently popular band like R.E.M. that will impress your young readers with how hip you are. Um, you throw in some garbled sort of psych sub-psychedelic philosophy. Um, and you've got a modern comic. Doesn't matter whether it has any substance, doesn't matter whether it has any direction, but it hits enough of the right button so that people will recognize this as something modern and experimental and daring. And of course, it is not in the least bit experimental. He became disappointed with the fandom surrounding the post-1986 postmodern superhero comic book movement that resulted from his unintentional revitalization of the genre, which he explained again in 1997. Watchmen did seem to open the doors for a lot of people who had they grasped the surface of Watchmen. They grasped that it had got grittier violence, um, a more adult approach to sexuality. Uh, they probably couldn't grasp exactly how to do some of the clever semiotic stuff that we were doing, but they got the sex, the violence, the pretension, the references to popular song lyrics, things like that, which all made it very 80s and very modern. And I've seen a lot of retreads of that kind of comic sensibility since that to me have seemed depressing, pretentious, um, and yet I have to own up to a certain paternity there. Right. You know, the, the child is ugly, but it's probably mine. You know, and that has tended to blunt it a bit. I um, wouldn't like to say that Watchmen had a good effect upon comics. I think it was a good comic book, but I wouldn't like to say that it had necessarily a good effect upon comics. It might just have doomed us to 10 years of heavy-handed pretension. Alan Moore's journey in the comic book industry, as depicted in his anthology Illuminations and interviews, illuminates the often painful tension between creative vision and commercial exploitation. His evolution from an enthusiastic creator keen on portraying superheroes realistically to a disappointed critic of the industry's corporatization offers a poignant narrative of the trials faced by artists in mainstream success. His critique, while viewed by some as mean-spirited, raises essential questions about the comic book industry's practices, its treatment of creators, and the unintended consequences of its rampant commercialization. Moore's experience serves as a crucial reminder for the comic book industry to continually reevaluate its relationship with creators. Only through this sort of self-evaluation can it continue to foster artistic innovation and creativity, underpinning the necessity of his critique as a wake-up call to the industry.